Welcome everyone to the Hobby Hour. My name is Jay Sundemeyer, a professor of practice here at the Hobby School of Public Affairs at the University of Houston. We are particularly delighted and excited to have today as a guest, yes. a Houston Hi. City Council member, Edward Pollard, who represents District J, the most diverse part of the very diverse city of Houston, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, Council member Pollard is a proud product of Southwest Houston himself. He attended all Houston independent school district schools before accepting a basketball scholarship at uh, Morehouse College in Atlanta. Uh, he is a true scholar athlete. He was recognized as an NCAA academic All-American and graduated from college with honors, earning his BA in political science. After that, uh, he played professional basketball in both Singapore and Chile, which we hope also to talk about. Uh, Edward returned to Houston to pursue his law degree at the Thurgood Marshall School at uh, Texas Southern University. He also received his certification in negotiation mastery from Harvard Business School. He is the principal owner of the Pollard Legal Group, a boutique civil litigation law firm located in District J. And he is also the founder of Suits for Success, a nonprofit that mentors teen boys on life skills in high schools in his district. We also hope to talk about that. As a member of council, which he's been since 2019, uh, council member Pollard serves as vice chair of the uh, budget and fiscal affairs committee and serves on the committees for economic development, ethics, elections and council governments, public safety, homeland security and childhood and youth. Quite a, a list. Welcome, Councilmember Pollard, to the Hobby Hour. Ambassador, thank you for having me. Well, we're delighted. There's so much to talk about, but let's uh, start with your origins. Uh, as I mentioned, you grew up in Houston and uh, had a, a mixed uh, career in both academia and athletics. But I'd like to know, at what point in your life did you become interested in possibly doing public service? So I've always kind of been uh, around public service. My family has a rich legacy of service. My grandfather is Reverend T.J. Jemison, who actually served as Dr. Martin Luther King's mentor. My grandfather organized the first bus boycott in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, which was the blueprint for the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. Dr. Martin Luther King came down to stay with my grandfather in Baton Rouge uh, to learn the strategy on how to put forth a bus boycott in, in Alabama. The difference between the two is my grandfather's bus boycott in Baton Rouge only took eight days. And so Martin Luther King thought that, you know, it wouldn't be that long of a process if he did the same in Alabama. However, uh, it was over a year for that bus boycott, and that's how it got so much global recognition and was such a pivotal point in the civil rights movement. Uh, so I have a rich legacy of uh, service through my family. Uh, my father served in the Vietnam War. My mother is a teacher. They always uh, stress service and community. Um, and so growing up, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer and I was always interested in government. And so that's why I went into uh, political science as a major when I got to Morehouse College. Did you know your grandfather? And if so, did he uh, tell you about his experiences there in the civil rights movement? Yes, I, I knew my grandfather. He didn't pass away until I was almost out of college. Um, and so we had a very close relationship. Growing up, you just look at your grandfather and hear the things that he was able to accomplish. And, and it doesn't resonate as it does when you get older and start to really understand the magnitude of the events. Uh, and the, uh, the way in which he was a pioneer throughout the civil rights movement. Um, but I carry that legacy with me and, I, and it's something that I cherish uh, because I want to ensure that many of the sacrifices that he made in dozens and dozens and well, countless others uh, in that period of time, uh, the sacrifice they made now, um, I stand on their shoulders to ensure that you know, the work that they put in continues to progress forward uh, through the work that I'm doing. Uh, was he still living as of your election to the council? He was not. He, uh, he passed away in the, in the mid-2000s. Uh, 
Um, and at that point in time is when I really was starting to think about a career in uh, elected office. Um, and I knew once I got out of law school that that was something that I was going to do. But his, uh, you know, that definitely rubbed off on me. Yes, well, I'm sure he would have been extremely proud of you uh, had he uh, still been with us as of your election. And uh, but you carry on in that legacy. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your your time in basketball. Uh, was there a period of your life when you thought you might um, do that is your life's calling? Yes. Yeah, so after I graduated from Morehouse College in 2007, my goal was to play pro professional basketball basketball. I wanted to ultimately go to the end, did not get drafted. So my, my other route to get there was to play overseas and see if I can get recognized there and then come back to the States. And so I played in Chile and I also played in Singapore. And um, I was waiting to get a, a contract to go to another country. Um, but the, the, the LSAT score that I took in undergrad only lasts three years. And so I knew I had to either get a contract to go play basketball overseas. And if I did not get it, then I would go to law school. So I gave myself up until August to when law school would begin. And I told myself if I got a contract before then, I would continue playing basketball. But if I did not, I would go to law school. And so August came, I got no contract to play anywhere. So I, I, I enrolled in law school. And by October, I got a new contract to go back overseas. This time to Lithuania. And so I had to ask myself, you know, do I want to go back and pursue my my dreams of basketball or stay in law school? And I decided to stay in law school. Well, what was lost to uh, the uh, professional uh, sports world was gained in the legal and political world. So uh, a great example of uh, that old poem by Robert Frost about two roads diverging in a yellow wood. And I took the road uh, and uh, hopefully you haven't regretted uh, taking that path. It was the right decision looking back. But uh, uh, for a moment, what was it like to live and play basketball in Singapore and Chile? Well, that was the first time I, I truly traveled internationally, and I was young in my early 20s. You know, for me, it, it really gave me an appreciation that we have here in the United States. Uh, you don't really understand in, uh, the living conditions or the circumstances in which culture plays a role in your daily life until you're somewhere that's foreign. And you really don't know the culture, you don't know the language, you don't understand the customs, uh, but it gives you a greater appreciation for the many things that we have here in the United States. And so um, that was the main thing I took from it, but also getting a a greater appreciation for uh, different ways in which people um, um, live in different uh, countries. And so now that I represent District J, which is an extremely diverse area of the city of Houston, you know, those circumstances give me a greater appreciation and value for different people from different backgrounds and allows me to have a much more open mind, not only communicate, but in ways in which we serve. Would you recommend other young people uh, live overseas uh, for whatever reason, uh, academics, uh, sport, travel, a job? Yes, definitely, because it just broadens your perspective. You know, here growing up in Houston, especially in Texas, we think Texas is the end all be all. We think everyone else is in second place and there's nothing that is more attractive than being in Texas. Uh, but once you step out of these boundaries and you go, and meet different people in different places. It just gives you a, a much broader perspective of life. It gives you a much broader perspective of how big this world is. Uh, and then some of the values uh, that you're able to bring back and some of the perspectives that you're able to bring back should help you grow, not only professionally, but for sure, personally. And uh, uh, final question on that, uh, which uh, country did you like more, Singapore or Chile? Probably Singapore, 
because it was much more modern. Uh, in Chile, you know, I, I could be in a modern city one day and then travel to an undeveloped city the, the next. But in Singapore, everything was really modern um, and Americanized. Uh, it was a very clean city. Um, and what I, what I noticed the most and what I remember is the city never slept. So at all times, it was just um, nonstop traffic, nonstop stop movement, nonstop action. Uh, it could be, you know, three o'clock in the morning and you look outside and there's, it's lively. And so it was so many people with so many uh, things to do um, that I'll never forget. And from my experience there, it's also a country where the national pastime is eating, uh, that uh, people love to eat and have many, many options. Yes, that's true. Well, let's uh, now uh, move to the, another exotic city, Houston. Uh, you represent District J. Uh, tell us about it, uh, what uh, its people are like and uh, its politics. So District J is, if you're on 59 South, it's everything between 610 and the Beltway. So you have Gulfton, Sharpstown, Westwood, Brayburn, and Ailey. It is the most diverse district in the entire city where 75% of our residents do not speak English as the first language at home. 85% of our residents live in apartment complexes and we're the most densely populated area of the city of Houston. Uh, the average uh, per square mile is 3000 people per square mile uh, in the city of Houston and district J it's 10,000 people per square mile. And so it's, it's uh, a melting pot of people. Usually, uh, Gulfton and other areas of District J are some of the first places people reside when they first come uh, to Houston uh, from different countries. And so there's language barriers, there's culture barriers, uh, but we found ways in which to really communicate through trusted partners and just continuing to develop relationships. Well, let's dig a little deeper into that. Uh what challenges are there in representing a district where I presume a huge percentage of the population are not citizens, they are not voters, uh, politicians usually are attuned to the people who can vote for them, and in your case, you've got to serve a lot of people who can't vote for you. Good question. So when I first got elected in 2019, and then we start, I, I came into office in 2020, a few months later, the pandemic hit. And that was a huge challenge, both from a communication standpoint and a culture standpoint. Uh, we had many people from different um, cultures and countries living in close proximity. And many of them could not work virtually. They had to do the work that it required them to still go and be in person. And so really trying to um, be able to communicate with them as it pertains to the, the safest way to coexist, the importance of wearing your mask, the importance of you know socially distancing, the importance of uh, some of the safety precautions that we put in place. And, and then you mix that with the eviction crisis that we had uh, who live in apartment complexes and trying to find them housing relief and rental relief. Uh, that was a challenge. Uh, and so when you moved into the winter storm year, the same type of thing, uh, the communication barriers, trying to ensure that people had the right type of information um, and understood where they could get resources from. So that's always a challenge. Uh, so so it's, it's a continuous balance trying to uh, meet the needs of a very diverse community. And one of the ways in which we do that is we try to develop relationships with different churches, uh, mosques, uh, temples, synagogues, uh, you know, nonprofits, the property management teams at the apartment complexes. Uh, and then we want them to see us on a regular basis. And so even though I may not speak the language, uh, they see me as someone that is continuously active uh, that is in front of them trying to uh, be boots on the ground to do things uh, to improve their quality of life. And that's something that translates uh, regardless of where you're from. When people see that you're actively trying to help and you're actively consistently showing up, then 
and they buy into to what your vision is. Does it make a difference to you, though, if the people we're talking about are citizens and voters versus those who are citizens and voters? I treat everyone the same. Um, of course, I know which pockets uh, that we have um, higher voter turnout and lower voter turnout. And I do keep that in mind when trying to ensure that, you know, the projects that we put in place are, are equitable. Um, but I do try to treat everyone the same, you know, regardless if you're here legally or if you're not, uh, because circumstances change for every single family. And my goal as the representative of the office is just to try to improve their quality of life the best way that I can. And improving quality of life is different for different people. You know, for people who are from the United States who have certain expectations, they may have uh, certain expectations of me that I need to meet. And those who are just coming here may have uh, a different set of expectations, but we try to treat everyone the same and we try to treat everyone fair. I imagine that many of the people you're talking about distrust government and have a different uh, and negative view of politicians. Uh, is that something you run across? Well, that comes across the, no matter what community you go to. Uh, there is a, uh, a level of distrust in government and a level of frustration with what you get for the taxes that you pay. Um, and so for me, it's I try to be very transparent, direct, and uh, very open with my communication. And I never try to overpromise anything. Uh, my biggest thing is trying to work with people, hear from them on their issues and concerns, and then try to find ways to collaborate with them to resolve the issue. Well, uh, we'll uh, get back to the district and some of the challenges you face there. Uh, I should mention to our viewers that uh, we uh, welcome questions for Council Member Pollard. I will reserve some time at the end of the program. And that uh, in order to submit a question, just click the Q&A feature uh, on your Zoom screen, and I will be able to uh, see those toward the end of the program. Uh, 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 Edward, uh, you were elected in 2019. I'd like to hear about what it was like to campaign in your district. But if I recall, that was not your first race for public office. Correct. My first race for public office was back in 2016. I ran for state representative of the same area that I'm currently representing for city council. I came up short in the primary, uh, but stayed very active. And I tell people all the time, it's really about building relationships and a name ID and a track record of work within your community. So I, I stayed active with the different civic clubs and homeowners associations, continued to go to the churches and organizational functions of the, of the district. And people began to uh, know me more and understand what my um, perspectives were and, and who I was as a person. And so I ran again in 2019 because there was an open seat for city council. Never thought about running for city council previously because city council, especially a district seat, is, 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 is truly boots on the ground the things that people need on a daily basis. So, you know, trash, streets, fire, police, parks, libraries, you know, those are the things that touch you every single day. And the district council member is the front line of those issues. Uh, but I saw it as a way in which I could uh, serve my community in a way in which I can um, try to improve the quality of life for, for all other families, but including mine as well. And so uh, we decided to run for that seat after prayer with my wife. And it was a tough race. I think I had seven people in the race. Uh, I was the only African-American in the race. I was the youngest in the race. And District J has no predominantly black neighborhoods. And so I knew that you know, every neighborhood that I went to and I knocked on the door, chances are someone was going to open the door that looked different than me. And so what I did was I, I tried to make the rounds. I knocked on as many doors as I could, as many times as I could. And I showed up to every event that I could. And I just tried to meet people in person, tried to listen more than I talked. And after a while, I think people were really receptive to our message of unity, to our message of truly trying to maximize their tax dollars 
not getting in the weak pendant, but someone that that's just tr truly looking at the issues and resonated and we were able to win the seat. Well, the key message from the story you just told us is that uh, never is wonderful uh, to lose an election, but you were not discouraged. Uh, you looked upon that as a way to introduce yourself and build upon that to win uh, another public office when it presented itself. Yes, I, I tell people all the time that I think you really truly find out if you want to be an elected official after you lose. And the day after, if you look at that and say, you know, campaigning is not for me. Some of the tough shots I took, it's not for me. The sacrifices away from my family and friends, it's not for me. Uh, you know, it will tell you, you will have all those experiences and thoughts after the fact. But if you lose and you still want to stay committed to being out there in the community and continuing to build, uh, it will reveal itself. And so losing for me highlighted the fact that I truly wanted to do that and that I will continue pressing on uh, to achieve my, my goal of being an elected representative. Well, that's a, a wonderful point to make. And, and uh, you know, we had four presidents of the United States in a row. Uh, first, George Bush, Bill Clinton, then the second George Bush and Barack Obama. And the one thing they all had in common is they lost their first race for public office. And uh, they, they came back and uh, reached the top. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> Mental note. It, it is an important uh, bit of history there. Uh, well, uh, we'll talk a little bit more still about uh, the issues that you deal with, but tell us about the dynamic of being on the city council. It's a mix of district representatives like yourself and at-large members. And what we're always told is that in the city of Houston, uh, we have a strong mayor form of government, that the mayor has the power, the mayor has the money, the mayor has uh, the uh, visibility that uh, individual members don't. So what is it like to be a district councilman in such a system? So, I try to explain to people that the council of the city is basically the board of directors for the city. And you have 16 board of directors, uh, 11 are council members from districts and five are council members at large. And then you have the mayor who is the 17th person uh, around the horseshoe. And he basically serves as the chair of the board. Now the mayor, yes, it is a strong form mayoral form of government, which basically means that the mayor is the only one that can put something on the agenda. If, if the mayor does not put it on the agenda, then it cannot be discussed. However, although the mayor is the only one that can put something on the agenda, he still needs nine votes to pass anything. So that's where I think the leverage and the ability to work with him and his administration uh, comes into play as a council member and especially as a district council member uh, because he cannot put forth anything or pass anything uh, without knowing that he has enough votes to pass it. And so I try to utilize that to my um, advantage at times by uh, caucusing my own votes or whipping my own, own votes on a particular um, particular uh, not strength, but uh, voting power on a, on an item. Uh, you can use that to your advantage uh, for something he wants to do or for, or for something that I want to do. And so there, there, there's a give and take with that. Um, and so like anything else, having a good relationship with uh, your colleagues matters. So having a good relationship with the other council members and especially the mayor uh, it, you're able to still advance things from a, from a council seat. So the lesson there is uh, uh, that friends count, that uh, you might have a furious discussion with one of your colleagues around the horseshoe, but uh, you, you shouldn't let that uh, affect your relationship because you might need them uh, the next issue. That's, in, that's, that's very true. I, you cannot be too, you can't take things too personal uh, in politics. I think it's more important to be respectful and to keep a reputation as someone who's open-minded and fair, 
fair and balanced. And you can disagree with someone without being disagreeable. And so I really try to uh, develop a relationship with everyone because there's going to be a time and place in which you're going to need to lean on on them and they're going to need to lean on you and the mayor understands that as well because he can't get anything passed without having at least nine votes and the last thing the mayor wants to do is put something on the agenda that he wants to advance and it doesn't go forward and so relationships matter and what you do today could ultimately affect something that you need done a year from now so you always have to remind yourself not to take things too personal and to continue to develop good relationships with your colleagues. Well, uh, what's been the uh, nature of serving on the city council during the COVID epidemic when uh, the council could not meet in the same room? Yeah, that was a difficult time period. And um, it was something that for all of us was brand new. And not only did you not you weren't able to see your colleagues in person, but it was difficult to go over policy. It was different to, it was difficult to, to really bounce ideas off of each other. And everyone was really preoccupied with just trying to maintain and sustain during COVID. So all of the main issues that you, that you thought you would come into office trying to push certain projects that were important to you or that you ran a campaign on, you had to put all that on pause and focus strictly on uh, COVID-19 and finding ways for us to get back to some sense of normalcy. So we had lots of food distributions, lots of mass distributions, lots of, lots of rental relief strategies, uh, lots of uh, strategies to help small businesses uh, stay uh, the testing and the logistics around that. And then the vaccines and the logistics around that, everything became more of uh, emergency management more than anything else. How did the council meet? Was it everybody in their home on Zoom or could some people actually show up in City Hall? Well, it was virtual. So most people uh, were taking the meeting from home or maybe their office. I just decided to go to, to, to City Hall Chambers every week, and I would pop open my laptop in Council Chambers by myself, uh, just because one, we still had a lot of frontline workers that still had to show up in person. And I wanted to send a message that, you know, if you have, if we're requiring you to show up, then we're going to show up as well, or at least I'm going to show up. And so I would, I would go every Wednesday and have uh, council meetings by myself with my laptop in the city hall chambers, but everyone else decided to do it from wherever they felt comfortable. It must have been a bit lonely there in that big room all by yourself. Or spacious. <laughs> yes. But no, it was, it was, uh, it was. It was it was just a, a subtle a subtle message that I wanted to send, and um, eventually the mayor thought it was appropriate to bring people back, and so now we are meeting back in person. Terrific. Well, let's uh, go back to District J, uh, and talk specifically about uh, COVID uh, in such things as inoculations and uh, people's health in general. Uh, were you? personally active and trying to get uh, your constituents and other residents of the district to uh, get vaccinated? Yes, um, they had a story that I was a part of in the New York Times when in the, in the middle of COVID that had one area of my district, which is Gulfton, and it's uh, mostly apartment complexes, which it borders Bel Air, which is a more affluent neighborhood of the city. In Bel Air, they did not have many uh, positive COVID tests because people had health insurance, they were practicing safety precautions, uh, they were able to virtually work, you know, they were, they were, they, they had the vaccine. But in in the Gulfton area, where people were not able to socially distance, they had to go up 
to work every single day. They had culture barriers, they had language barriers, they did not have health insurance. This, there was a huge spike in cases. And so it was like one of the epicenter for positive cases. And so it was always our goal as an office to try to continue to stress ways in which to remain safe for those residents of those type of areas. And we did, we did stress getting the vaccine uh, and ultimately and eventually people did start to uh, uh, take heed to what we were putting out access to I get to get uh, lower income and minorities um, comfortable with uh, taking the vaccine and even going to get tested at times. And it's not just District J, but we saw it citywide that minority and low income, communities were more hesitant to get tested and get the vaccine than others. Is there a larger lesson in that about uh, the way that lower income uh, communities feel about the healthcare system? I think it's more of a trust thing than anything else. When you are lower income uh, and you don't have as many amenities or you don't have as many resources, you're distrustful of people saying that you need to do something or that it's free to come and do this you have going on in your life seems like it's just free and better. And so we had to continue to just stress to people the importance of it, use trusted messengers in each of the communities that spoke those languages. And uh, eventually, I think with the help of uh, you know, this the robust news coverage on every single channel every single day about the need to be safe and the need to get vaccinated. Ultimately, they did. Um, in addition to healthcare, you've spent a great deal of time and attention on policing in your district. Uh, talk about that, if you will, about the need and the solution you came up with. So public safety is always been my number one priority. Uh, you cannot have a thriving city or a thriving community unless people feel safe and comfortable. And so we have to we have to be creative in the way in which we police our communities. A lot of that uh, was highlighted with the murder of George Floyd and understanding how to collaborate, uh, serve. And so my office came up with the District J Patrol, which is the new modern approach to community policing, where we have a website, districtjpatrol.com, that allows residents to go there and report a neighborhood related crime or violation. And it gets routed over to a specialized HPD unit. And then that unit collaborates with neighborhood leaders to address that issue. And so we've had over 1,000 submissions on that uh, portal over the past year. And it's something that we're seeing is uh, beneficial not only to the community, but also to law enforcement. Uh, we pay for their overtime pay to address those issues. We put them in specialized vehicles, which are on-road, off-road, uh, Polaris vehicles that can get into vacant lots down in bayous in between apartment complexes and they're open concept so when they come down your street it's easier to communicate with the residents and so i encourage everyone to go to districtjpatrol.com check out the website the, the most interesting feature on it to me is there's a a result to the the progress of your submission so we're very transparent with the public on what's happening with each report that comes in so that you can follow it along the way. And it holds HPD accountable to ensure that they actually address the reports that, that come into the portal. Just to see if I understand, are the actual members of the patrol HPD officers or are they other? No, they're HPD officers, but they're working uh, through overtime pay on this particular patrol. Very good. Uh, what was the reaction from the Houston Police Department when you came up with the idea? Were they positive or did they think that was their business and their business alone? Well, they were hesitant at first because it was a new idea. And especially when you incorporate the vehicles in the online website, 
that was something completely new to them. And so as in government, when I, as I noticed coming into government a couple of years ago, whenever you come with a new idea, it's, it's met with a little resistance and hesitancy. So I have to push people in all the different departments to be creative and think outside the box and not have this mind think that is the most dangerous phrase in business. So I pitched them on the uh, District J Patrol idea. Initially, they were hesitant, but I continued to push and push and push. Eventually, we just put up the website ourselves. And once they started to see the reaction, uh, I, I think they could not I deny that it was a feature. That, and now uh, it's something that they tout and something that... Uh, you know, we work well together with. Now oh, that's excellent. And have any of your colleagues set up their own patrols in their districts? Well, there have been some uh, different districts that have looked into getting the Polaris vehicles that we have for their officers, but we're still the only district that has the website component, which is the most important aspect of the District J Patrol. Our website is maintained independently by community volunteers. And so it does take uh, a lot of effort and commitment uh, for those who are truly vested in trying to improve the quality of life and the public safety in their neighborhoods. Uh, but it's something that we do believe can be replicated all over the city. Well, next to policing of trash and uh, environmental issues, flooding are big, big issues in Houston. So how have you uh, gone after those, considering once again that it is the mayor who runs those departments and uh, council members have to uh, ask for it, that kind of help? What we try to do as much as we can independently of the mayor. When it comes to trash, uh, we set up private trash for our district uh, to, to uh, collect heavy trash and tree waste. Um, and so we understand that the solid waste department um, has some challenges in being on time and reliable with the, with the routine trash service. So we wanted to supplement uh, that service with private trash um, and that's paid for out of my council district uh, budget. Uh, and it goes from, from house to house, uh, curbside pickup for any resident that signs up for it. Uh, so we've looked into that for trash, for flooding, uh, we've gone outside of the city, but started to partner with the, the county as well as the federal government in finding and identifying outside dollars for projects. We have a, uh, a large um, drainage and flooding mitigation project in District J in the, the Gessner and 59 area uh, that will commence soon that we were able to identify $6 million from uh, federal money uh, to come down uh, to our district and uh, to local dollars. We try to find outside partners and leverage whatever we have uh, with, with those dollars. Yes, uh, if you will, what is the budget that you have, uh, both in terms of dollars and your ability to make those decisions on your own, where to spend it? So we have one mil, each district council member gets $1 million annually on projects for their district. 500,000 of that needs to go towards um, transportation projects, mobility projects, so streets and sidewalks, you know, speed, speed humps, things like that. And then the other 500,000 can be for just neighborhood projects. It can be to improve a park. It could be for overtime pay for the Houston Police Department department. Uh, but what we try to do, so we'll leverage that $1 million into dollars with our management districts, our TERS, our county partners, uh, as well as working with our, con our congressional delegation. And so we try to use a part of our, our money uh, to, to maybe match, also match with some uh, and you may be able to turn, you know, one hundred thousand dollars into four hundred thousand dollars just just by working with other entities as well. 
Uh, Houston has a great number of homeowner associations. They're very powerful. Uh, do you uh, find it difficult or easy to work with those associations? Well, those associations are just like many governments themselves. And so they have their own power structure and their own, a lot of times, deed restrictions and bylaws that they must, uh, that govern what they can and cannot do. We work well with them. Um, there are lots of challenges because of lots of different personalities and lots of different perspectives, but we do work well with them based off the fact that we go to them and ask them, what are your needs? We don't try to tell people what they need within their own neighborhood. We like to ask them directly, what do you all need? And then we try to take that list of needs and then be creative about the way we can reapproach them with solutions. And um, that's worked well for us. And that's how we're really able to utilize what's on their priority list uh, to, to make our own priority list. Well, everybody who serves in public office knows that you can't make everybody happy at the same time. That's a rule of life, but especially pertinent in government. So uh, what have you found in your time as a public servant of how you deal with people that you just don't agree with? Or uh, does that create a problem or is there, are there ways of addressing that issue? For, for me, the biggest thing is just to always be honest and direct with people. Um, I think they can respect the fact that you may not have the same opinion as they do, but as long as you approach them in a respectful manner and you don't try to lie or, or, or work around them, uh, then you can live to fight another day on a different issue. And so, you know, we try to be very direct with uh, people who have counter viewpoints and always try to be as cordial and professional as possible. And that keeps the relationship decent uh, because you're never going to be able to satisfy everyone. But you, what you don't want is for people to say that he was rude or he didn't listen or he did not take my issues or concerns seriously. Uh, and so as long as we maintain that, uh, we're able to ultimately uh, continue to develop a relationship. And although we may not uh, have the same viewpoint on that particular matter, hopefully on the next one, we will. Well, I applaud your approach because frankly, it was the same approach I had when I was an elected official as a state legislator. And that is that uh, if you are uh, honest with people, if you explain your position and why you took that position, even though it's different from theirs, there is a certain number of people, not 100%, but not zero either, who will give you credit for at least coming at that issue with uh, an open mind and an honest perspective. And uh, even though they may disagree with you, even fiercely on some issue, they will still vote for you because they appreciate that in a public servant. I, it, we have the same mindset. That's what I've discovered as well. And I think that is the ultimate way to truly have true progress. Um, even as a person who uh, I consider myself a centrist. And so I try to work well on both sides of the aisle, but there's gonna be times when I disagree with, with, with one side and there's gonna be times that I agree. But I think the approach and the directness of the way in which you uh, communicate with people ultimately is how they receive the information and how they view you as an individual person. And as long as you can maintain a professional relationship with someone with, with mutual respect, then regardless of how you all uh, see a particular issue, you'll still be able to maintain that relationship and work with them going forward. Well, we're going to uh, uh, take a question in just a moment, but before we do, uh, could you tell us about Suits for Success, your nonprofit? So Suits for Success is a nonprofit that I helped found in 2014, and it targets high school age boys. We put them through a semester long mentorship course where they learn things that they would not learn in a traditional cl uh, classroom setting such as public speaking, etiquette training, resume building, interview techniques, how to tie a tie. And at the completion of the program, each student receives a free suit, shirt, and tie for high school graduation and life beyond. 
And so what we try to do is serve as mentors to, to boys who are on the cusp of graduation to try to instill in them uh, tools and, and knowledge on things that they need to know as young men uh, outside of the high school walls and as they approach the real world ways in which they can be as productive as possible and try to steer them in the right direction based on some of the mistakes we may have made when we were in their shoes uh, at that age. And so it's been a program that we've seen a lot of success over the years. We stay in touch with many of our alum uh, and we use them to come back and help um, teach courses as well. Um, but it's probably the most rewarding aspect of what I do professionally is being able to mentor these young men Many of them have a lot of potential uh, and a lot of talent. They just need opportunity and exposure. And so that's what we try to provide. Uh, who are your sponsors? Uh, I'm sure it costs money to buy those suits and ties. So many of the suits and ties that we, uh, that we provide are gently worn and donated from men all over the city. And so we have, uh, year round collections where if people have a wear, um, they will donate that suit to our program and we will inventory it. At the end of the year, students will in the program get to select from uh, uh, an assortment of suits and they'll select a suit, a shirt and a tie. We'll take them to the tailor and get it uh, tailored just to their uh, size. And um, it's, it's, it's amazing to see their transformation from taking off the hoodie and taking off the jeans and putting on that suit and tie. Uh, you can see that their self-confidence rises right before your eyes. Well, I imagine we could talk for an hour just about that uh, outstanding program and uh, some of the uh, lessons learned, but let us go to a question from the audience. And uh, we have a question which is, do you work with grassroots groups in your district? And if so, how do you navigate them around special interests? Yes, I work with grassroots groups all the time. Uh, many times they will email our office or approach us out at an event about whatever their special interest is. Uh, and we try to be very receptive to the needs of the different grassroots groups in our district. Uh, so whether it's, you know, animal welfare or it's domestic violence or it's parks and recreation, after school programs, we, we try to do as an office is we try to be a facilitator and use our platform to give them more of a, a voice. And so if a grassroots organization has a particular interest or a particular idea that they want to advance, we'll use our office to, to uh, either put forth their information, collaborate with them on an event, um, but ensure that they have a broader reach uh, by, by working with us. Uh, the questioner asked about special interests. Uh, usually what that refers to are businesses or professions that have a particular reason to interact with government, in this case, city government. And we're talking about contractors, architects, engineers, uh, consultants of various sorts. How do you deal with those uh, so-called special interests? Well, we try to uh, take as many meetings uh, as possible. And we, we listen to all types of different uh, entities and individuals when it comes to their specific needs. Uh, like I said earlier, we never try to over promise or, or from the outset tell a person what we can do, uh, but we try to receive as much information as possible and then decide as an office if that's something that we want to stand behind and advance or push ourselves at City Hall. And if so, then we'll work directly with those stakeholders on that. And if not, then we'll be direct with them about why we have decided that that's not a position that we want to take and hopefully uh, continue to build a relationship with them on something else down the road. Well, uh, it's often said that the special interests are the, are the key players in especially local politics. 
city, county government, to a degree, state government. Um, uh, so do you take contributions from uh, people who do uh, qualify as uh, special interests? Yes, I take support from, you know, a plethora of different uh, people, stakeholders, interest groups. Um, and I do it in a way in which uh, I want them to understand that just by supporting me financially does not mean that I automatically will back whatever issue you want to advance, but, but is to aid in ensuring that my I'm able to stay in office and run a strong campaign. Uh, but what we do as an office is we try to work well with everyone. And as a lawyer, I'm big on trying to find common ground. I'm big on being open-minded to compromise. And you may have a special interest group that comes in and they want you know, everything uh, and everything may not be possible, but working with them in ways in which maybe we can compromise on something that's more reasonable or something that may not be in their overall best interest, but, it, but there's something else that could be in their interest, but in the best interest of the community and finding a balance. And so there's always ways if they're willing to work with you. And if there's people who have uh, an open mind for compromise and an open mind for reasonableness, I think we can find a way to get most things done. Let's go to another question from the audience. And that is, uh, do you currently practice law as well? And if so, how do you balance being a council member and an attorney? Yes, I still practice law. Actually, I was in my law office earlier today, office at least five times a week. Um, since I own my own practice, I'm able to go when I can. So if it has to be early in the morning or late at night, um, I find ways to get there um, because that is the main resource and source of income for my family. Uh, so I, I, I do still practice. I lean on my uh, legal assistance a lot uh, when I'm away. And so having a good staff is critical, uh, but I enjoy being a lawyer. I worked hard to get uh, my bar license and so uh, practicing law is something that I want to continue to do as long as possible. And how would you uh, divide the time you spend practicing law versus your city work? Uh, what percentage for each? So I used to try to split it up 50-50. I came in the office saying that on Mondays, I would spend uh, my entire Monday in, at the law office. I would split my time on Tuesdays and Wednesdays between City Hall and my law office, and then Thursdays and Fridays back at my law office. But that hasn't been the case uh, because every week is completely different. And so you have to take it on a week by week basis. Um, and so I just try to find uh, a balance to where you have to lean on your staff as much as possible, understand that you can't get everything done every single day. Uh, but I do find ways in which to still stay active within my practice. And just like today, for instance, I was at my law firm at eight o'clock this morning. I did a couple hours of work and then I came here to City Hall. I'll be here until maybe four or five. And before I go home for the day, I may stop back by the law office for an hour or so and, um, and complete some things. It sounds like the answer to my question is that, that you spend 60% of your time on both your law practice and your counsel work. Uh, and how that works out arithmetically is another issue, but uh, probably feels like you do that. Um, in the closing time we have here, uh, let's uh, look ahead. Looks, uh, or do you hope to stay in public service uh, in elective office at uh, some level or another? How do you see your future? Yes, I truly enjoy I have. Um, it's a rewarding and, and grateful opportunity to be able to serve and represent others, so I don't take it for granted. I would like to be in elected office uh, going forward, even past this term. Uh, I enjoy being on city council because it's a nonpartisan position. Uh, and it's very grassroots where you can touch the people. 
Uh, so I, I, I want to spend as much time in municipal uh, government as, as I can. Uh, that, that's my trajectory. And does that mean uh, running for a council seat again or another office perhaps? Well, I'm gonna keep all my options open, uh, but I enjoy uh, being a council member. Um, I'm fortunate enough to represent those in District J and uh, time will tell what's next, but uh, I do wanna stay in local government. Very good. Well, uh, uh, we'll hope to keep in touch with you to, as time passes and, uh, and find out what happens. Uh, in the minutes we have remaining, uh, please tell us about your family. You've referred to them. Uh, and uh, what uh, is your wife also an attorney? Is uh, she involved in one of the professions? So yes, my wife is an attorney. Uh, we met in law school and uh, we, we were married in 2013 and um, we have a son together uh, who's six years old named EJ and I also have a stepdaughter Nadia who's 18 so I have one that's uh, a senior in high school and the other one that is in kindergarten so they're on two different sides of the spectrum um, but if you're going to be in elected office as you know Chase uh, you have to have a very supportive family um, they're going to make a lot of sacrifices. You're going to miss some time uh, being with them at certain events and um, important occasions. And so you have to really make those decisions with your family uh, to ensure that you have the support and encouragement necessary uh, to pursue your passions in public office or public service. And I've been fortunate to have a family uh, that understands that sacrifice and it makes it on a daily basis. Um, but they're also very much involved and engaged in the things that, that we do within the community. So I try to uh, incorporate my family in many of the community events, uh, many of the uh, uh, things that we're doing through initiatives in the district. And then my wife is my number one person I go to for advice on policy, on certain ideas that I have. And usually uh, she has even better ideas than the ones that I initially approach her with. So it's a, it's a good balance. And uh, if I may ask, uh, do your children enjoy those community activities? You know, sometimes it is a struggle to get them there, <laughs> but once they are there and they see the impact that they're making on the people, uh, Usually on the ride home, they're appreciative and grateful for the opportunity to be able to do that. And they are more appreciative of some of the, the, uh, the amenities and the resources that they have uh, that others may not be as fortunate to have as well. And so I try to really uh, push them to understand uh, service and why it's important. And through the years, I've seen that they are more committed and they aren't as resistant to come out and help with those, those type of events. And who knows, you may be training a new generation of uh, Pollards who are involved in public service. And hopefully uh, that is something that they see from me and they, they value that I do, that they take with them and they continue to push that ball forward and have a life of service for themselves. Well, thank you for this time, which I know is at the sacrifice of your being at that horseshoe. So we'll let you get back uh, to doing that duty. But uh, let me say, this has been a very rich uh, hour for understanding the life and work of a member of Houston City Council. You've helped us uh, understand what that is like in a, in a very, deep and meaningful way. So we are grateful for your uh, sacrificing from your public service to be with us. And let me say that to- uh, Well, thank you. Uh, Go ahead, please. Well, I was gonna say, thank you for having me again. I, I truly appreciate the opportunity. I've, I've learned a lot from you over the years, and this is a, another way in which we have been able to uh, collaborate and that it's been fortunate for not only you and I, but for those who are participating on the call. So thank you for everyone for participating. Thank you to the Hobby School of Public Affairs for having me and all the uh, collaborations that you all have done uh, to make this easy.
event possible, and I look forward to staying engaged in the future. Well, thank you again, and let me say to our audience that uh, we're grateful for your having tuned in. Uh, the Hobby Hour will take a break during the summer. We'll be back in the fall, and uh, we'll let you know who our guest star will be at that point, but we're grateful again to today's guest star, uh, Council Member Edward Pollard. Thank you much, and goodbye.